All right. Uh, today's Catello Foreman UI deep dive uh, is going to be by Kyle Baker covering the Persona's work uh, that he's done recently. All yours, Kyle. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to be covering the Personas, as Eric said. Um, and these are systems management Personas. Um, and soon to be DevOps personas, but it's kind of a mixture at that point. Um, so I put these personas on the uh, Catello Foreman wiki, and um, these are available to anybody. You can go in and look at them, um, and they're also going to be incorporated into the new features um, section, so um, they'll be integrated, um, and I'm going to show how that works a, a little bit later. Um, and I'll also present the feature section later as well, but um, for now we're going to talk about these personas. Uh, personas are something that's uh, new for us and maybe new for some of the people that are going to be working on this project, so um, I'm going to go over some of the basics, but a persona is an aggregate um, of our customer data and it really represents who we're trying to build these applications for. It's a real customer data that's, that's um, built so we have a grouping that uh, represents like this average. Um, and it's a fairly specific persona, so it's not like a, a persona is not like a role because a persona is going to cover the person. So how, much, how many years of experience they have, how much training they have, things like that, um, where a role wouldn't necessarily cover those things. And, th and those are really important. Um, you know, uh, specifically when it comes to the type of training they have, and, uh, and it, that could be a huge barrier, and I think it is a barrier in the applications now. So this is the kind of thing that it will address. Um, and so now, now that we have these personas, we are going to use them, and, and really they could be used by anybody at any point. Really, this will allow us to eliminate the assumption that we're making a lot of the times. We can know exactly who our customers are, exactly who we're designing for and building for, and what their needs are. That's really important. Um, and that way we can we don't have a lot of gaps, and in the past there have been gaps. So this is going to allow us to at least know where the gaps are and, and potentially avoid them. So we're going to use them, we'll use them downstream in the use case, or upstream in the use case, and um, in the use cases, in the beginning part of the, um, the efforts. So that's really where they're going to be a big deal. So we'll talk through the whole person's story, essentially, when we're, we're building these features. Um, and then eventually it'll make its way down. But when, you know, say, let's say when development is happening, we can always reference those so we, don't, we aren't making those assumptions. Um, and we have three different sections. Um, obviously we have this overview, but we also have a persona for the company itself so we can see exactly how this this company that these people are working in um, works and how their roles fit into this this company and I used a financial services company it could be really anything um, based on the interviews that I did um, it was very similar depending on across the different types of uh, uh, institutions so it didn't really matter whether it was financial or not but I just happened to choose financial for this um, so we could really put a face on um, these these personas this because it's supposed to represent the real world, and it does. Um, so the specific personas uh, for the actual people performing the tasks are a system engineer and a system administrator, and I'll explain the differences in a second. But um, for a persona, you often assign a name, and the reason we do that is so it becomes a person and not a role, um, because this is a per this does represent a person performing a task. Um, so that's that's important. So I assign them a name, and it's also easier to reference because this word system is used in both. Um, but that is their titles, and that is exactly what I took from um, the users. So, uh, and then again, eventually it will be de developer operations, which will be some kind of combination with system administrator. But I haven't interviewed any of those yet, so um, that's for the future. So I want to talk a little bit about how they were created. So. I started with a recruitment letter to the uh, Foreman Upstream, Satellite Upstream, um, or I'm sorry, Catello Upstream, and uh, really just looking for anybody that wanted to help me. Um, I know everybody's busy, so I got a couple of people that wanted to help. Um, so it was myself, a few other, um, a couple other user experience team members actually helped, as well as product manager and, and some of the developers, which I do appreciate all that help. If you did, you were part of it, um, so thank you. Um, 
So basically what I was looking for is at this point was to build a kind of a screener um, to figure out really what we wanted to look for. Um, and I ran that through, you know, by all of our teams and trying to figure out who we were looking for. Um, and then after we kind of figure out what we were looking for um, and where we could potentially look, uh, I built some interview questions. And these questions kind of covered all the things we're going to talk about here, but um, a lot of things related to their daily tasks, things that they actually do. Um, and I took those interview questions and ran them by our team, and uh, uh, including some of the um, uh, people outside our team in the field, things like that, um, to make sure we had a really solid set of interview questions. Um, I can post those at some point if somebody wants to read them, but they're really going to be covered in the personas. Um, and, and I did truncate the personas down, so we do have a little bit extra information if we need to add them at some point. Um, but I did at that point I would schedule the interviews. Um, the I, I would have somebody taking notes. I would I would ask each one of these um, team members to to answer the question really as honestly as possible, and I just listened and took the notes. Um, when we identified some of the, our customers and just groups of users and other infrastructures or um, other institutions to um, take these interviews. There was often, we did, we had seven seven or eight different institutions and we we're going to continue to interview more to verify the information we have now, but it's all very consistent. But it, in each one of those interviews there was usually the same role, so it doesn't seem like that many, but it was really like four people per interview. Sometimes it was one or two, but most of the time it was four. So I probably have, for system engineers, I probably have, I don't know, somewhere around 15, 16, 17, somewhere in there. Um, and it's system administrators, there was a couple of them. And we're going to continue interviewing the system administrators in the future um, just to verify. So we're going to continue doing these interviews as we can get them. But really was just trying to get as many interviews as we could get. Um, so once we had those interviews done, we had the notes, we, I went and identified the clusters of interviewees uh, and started grouping some of their information. It was very easy to group it because the information was very consistent. Um, and then I started building these personas um, and really tried to keeping those, those interviews in mind. I do have a couple of recordings from those, which I unfortunately can't release into the upstream, but what I can do is just... Um, you know, I reference them when I'm building the personas, so we should be able to reference the personas. We shouldn't need any of the origin information. Um, and then I, you know, ran these personas by um, some of the stakeholders, and uh, um, so we could have, you know, key attributes for them and, and some of those behavioral drivers, and then we could um, have something we could utilize and then put them somewhere that's successful, which is what we have here. So that's the process um, that we went through, um, trying to be... Um, as objective as possible throughout the whole process, so um, that was really important. So we clicked on the company that uh, we built, this generic company, and um, this really, there was a lot, I learned a lot of things from doing this, um, and one of the big things around these large institutions is their adversity to um, trying things that are new, I'm sorry, deploying things that are new. They they are very aware of new technologies, um, cutting edge te technologies, especially financial institutions. They know about them and the, their people are very knowledgeable. They know, um, specifically the system engineers, they know the technology that exists, they know how to use it and, it, and it's not because somebody told them to, it's because they on their own went and figured out how to, to use it and, and you know, they, then they're gonna be the ones that try to sell everybody on it. Um, and then that involves, after that, some sort of a business deal that they're going to have to make um, in order to uh, utilize it. But that was one of the big things that I learned um, from that. But they're they're not going to deploy it. And, and a big thing, too, is that they build their infrastructure around the processes, around the software that they currently have. So it involves changing all of their processes as well. So trying something new is a huge change for them, um, potentially. And they also have... Um, the system administrator role. Uh, I was I was under the impression that the system engineer initially was going to be the person not only managing the you know um, they're setting up their infrastructure and their networking and stuff, and then also be the one to deploy the hosts. That's not the case. They're different people. There's many different people involved in this process. Also, 
those system administrators are grouped into pieces, so or into organizations. So or they call them business units, but we really or we call them organizations. But um, you know, there's somebody working on retail, somebody working in the web space, and somebody working in the offices space, and they don't really talk to each other. They just deploy the host that they're given in the in the organ in the infrastructure that they have and the labs that they have. So they're responsible for those separate sections. The only person to see across all is just those engineers, and there's only a couple of them. So that's important to note. I learned those two things, but it's important to keep that in mind um, when we're talking about these companies. And it was very consistent across all of them. Um, so we're going to talk about the types of systems we have or hosts. Um, we have Linux, Windows, and other, which would be Unix, whatever other type of thing to have. Um, and that really kind of varied. And there was a very small percentage of other, but most of them were Linux and then some Windows. Um, more, I think it's probably going to be less Windows over time, um, and that's the indication that I have. But it's about 12,000 total, which is quite a few. There was a couple people that I interviewed that had 55 or 60, but the majority was uh, 12 or so. And like I said, mostly, mostly Linux, and you can see the breakdown in the pie chart there. Um, and then as far as the types of hosts that they have, right now they have about 25% bare metal and then a lot of virtual. And they're very comfortable with virtual. Virtual has been around for a while. They have all their processes built around virtual. Um, their software is, all their software deals are all centered around virtual management. And then a little bit of cloud. Only a few people knew about cloud or, or even started utilizing cloud. Um, but that was like a brand new concept for them and they're still, for us, I think it seems like it's been around forever, but for them it's something that's still brand new. So in the next five years, they give the indication it's going to be less virtual, about probably a, probably about 10% bare metal, so quite a bit less, um, but they still need bare metal in places. So another thing that I learned is there's a lot of fragmentation going on. Some, you know, they don't, they're not going to update all of their infrastructure at the same time. So they have old hardware, new hardware, um, just different combinations of things, different operating systems running in different places. Um, so their infrastructure is very large, and it's not all up to date all at the same time. So they still have to have bare metal around, um, whether they like it or not, simply from budgetary reasons. Um, it has nothing really to do with systems management at that point, as far as you know rationale. Um, and then virtual, obviously, they're bringing down a little bit because they're going to really bump up their cloud infrastructure. Um, and this requires them recruiting new people um, and, and, like I said, really changing their process. But that will happen, so it's something we need to be aware of. Um, and for their systems management environment, I built this map so you could see exactly how their processes work um, around infrastructure management. Um, so we have the Linux system engineer and then the Windows system engineer. Um, and they're both going to be building this uh, standard operating environment. It's um, and also patching. And so, if there's a new version of Linux that comes out, it's their job to um, or either update what exists or make a new build. And their job is to interface with the networking group, who's going to set up all the networking services, the procurement group, who manage all of the purchasing and things like that. They're going to be the ones responsible for entitlement, and then um, security group. And then they're re really just going to approve any any uh, software that's going to run in the infrastructure. So it's important to know that there's at least three groups there, most likely more than one person, so we're talking between six and eight people, part of different organizations which don't necessarily communicate with each other. So it's this system engineer's job to communicate with those people. And some of them touch the UI, some of them don't, but mostly it's a system engineer. And they'll have a Linux engine, system engineer and a Windows one. They don't. They work on different things with different processes, but they both communicate with those separate groups. So those network, procurement, and security group are not specific to Linux. They touch all the other operating systems as well. So this Linux system engineer is usually RHCE or some. They have tons of different um, approvals. They've been around for a while, and we'll talk about them specifically in a minute. But um, they'll take that build and push it to their, their Linux testing lab or Windows person, their Windows testing lab. Um, and I broke down what type of systems they have there. But really, they're... They'll have a cloud space that'll be separate from their lab, which I didn't document because it's so new. Um, but they'll kind of be everywhere, and it's basically they have to have all the types of machines, um, the hardware running with all the types of operating systems running so they can test it um, to make sure it works in their infrastructure because they have to mirror that infrastructure. So that's changing all the time. But they're basically spending their time in that testing lab, making sure everything works. 
And then once they've got something that works, they'll push it to a some type of web portal or maybe it's a, a, a series of emails or something. They're going to communicate with those system administrators that something new is available that they need to push. And they'll also monitor that to make sure that the system administrators are doing their job and, and pushing the stuff out because sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So it's their job to make sure the infrastructure is up to date and provide the, the things that the system, the system administrators need because they're not the ones that are experts and they're not going to be the ones communicating with those networking group or procurement group or security group. There's quite a few of those system administrators. So for the system administrators, um, there's different sections of the, as I said, business units they have within their, their organization. So they'll have a retail space which manages, you know, their if it's financial, it's going to be managing their, you know, um, wherever the customers come in and, uh, um, you know, do their banking, I guess. Um, and then the um, web properties, which is all their internet banking, everything that basically has a URL, essentially, um, and which is growing more. Um, and it's also becoming more, it's 100%, I, here I have it 100% virtual, but it's probably a little bit cloud as well, and it will be growing more and more and more. And then the office environment where they have the people who work for the bank, um, and they have to deploy new systems there, and they're going to have to deal with a lot of crazy hardware at that point, outdated hardware, so it's like 50% bare metal at that point. Um, so like kiosks and stuff and all that kind of thing are going to be uh, like the retail system administrators. So a big thing here is that you can see that system engineer is going to cover like this first half, and then the system administrator covers the second half. It's two different people doing two different jobs. Um, that's really important to note, and I think that's one of the things that I learned here that we don't, I think that we could do better, um, is covering that second half. Um, because these people, it's important to know that the system administrators, they don't know anything about Puppet, they don't know anything about configuration management, just in general, they just want to deploy hosts. That's it, because they're, those system administrators are responsible for taking care of their customers, and customers being whoever they're servicing, so if it's an office environment, the office workers, that type of thing. So not directly to people that are purchasing, but not like a traditional customer. They call them customers, but they're users. Um, so here in this section, I have the personas, and I broke down um, their job title, how often they use the UI, their user experience, their role, and then a description of what they are. Um, and I have this repeated again in, in the actual persona itself, but it's something that you can easily reference here. And I'll, I'll go into those in a second. Um, the roles... These are, these are more generic. These are not um, specific to a person. Um, so this isn't going to have their daily usage or years of experience. This just has what this role does. Um, and, I, and, and I didn't do a persona for these because we don't really need to build the UI around these, these infrastructure roles, really, because they aren't really touching the UI very much. Um, so we have the system architects, as we just pointed out, and the system administrators. You can see that there's 20 system administrators. I bet I, I would say there's probably 20 system administrators per um, per business unit for them. Um, so there's a lot of system administrators. There's only a couple Linux engineers and only a couple Windows and one. Um, so it's one person responsible all of Linux, one person responsible for all of Windows. And that's across the entire infrastructure. But they're an expert. They've been doing this for a long time. The administrators, not so much. Um, the networking team is usually two or three people. Procurement team, two or three people. And security team, two or three people. Um, and I can show you here that um, whether they use the application, how much they use the actual UI. The system administrators almost always UI. I gave them a benefit of the doubt here saying they use a little bit of CLI. But really, it's almost all UI. Automation, anybody setting off automation is generally one of those system architects or system engineers. They, they're they the people setting up automation. The system administrators just utilize the automation. And that's usually to get around a pro, some sort of gap in the applications. So they're running scripts that they were given to them by the system architects. They're not writing any automation. They're UI people. They're you know somebody that's 25. It's not just to get out of college. doesn't really know a lot about um, they have, they're not very seasoned, so they don't really know how to hack around and deal with this infrastructure. Also, mobile. Um, nobody's using mobile, um, but the system architects do plan on using mobile more, but it's simply just mo in a monitoring capacity, not necessarily. They're not going to be you know, creating their builds you know, on a cell phone. That um, doesn't make sense for them. So that's the um, 
company. Um, so you can kind of, like I said, kind of see how these personas work in this environment. Um, are there any questions? No? Okay, good. Um, so personas? This is the first persona. Um, it's very important, this persona, because this is a person that's really interacting with satellite the most. Um, and this is Samuel. He's a system engineer, and he works for the Acting Services Financial Service Company. Um, and the quote here, and this is taken directly from um, an interview, but it says, "We think of innovative ways to make systems management better for the whole institution." So they have to think institution-wide, um, <clears throat> not just for that particular business unit. And they're the they're the go-to Linux people. Um, and nobody else really knows about Linux except for them, except for maybe a couple of networking people, but mostly them. Um, they use Catello Foreman for six hours a day. They're in there a long time. I think it would be a good goal to get it so they're not in there quite so much, um, but they're in there a lot. Um, and they also have seven years of experience specifically for systems management. A lot of them had 15 plus years of experience, but seven years is about a safe number. Um, and probably, 20 in IT specifically, um, and then their primary role is system architect. Um, so their their role, like I said, is is they're going to be the ones that are building the automation, building all the procedures. They're going to be going, they're going to be going to all the stakeholders with these um, these builds. Like they will go through and make a whole uh, requirement build. Um, for their infrastructure, and they'll actually have to get buy-off from all of upper management. They'll be the ones going through those processes and really pushing that. If there's new technology, they'll be the ones to find it. They'll be the ones to say, this is what we should use, this is what we should not use, and convince the people who have the business in the business department, this is what we should be doing. Um, they also handle all of the entitlement for um, any of the Windows or Linux systems. Um, they're the ones responsible for making sure that the the systems are up to date um, and and um, that they're secure. So that's really important to know. Um, so I broke down that last map that we were just looking at to this um, this specific section. So you can see the process that he goes through for just building. So this is the system engineer. They're going to go. They're going to work with the security group, the procurement group, and the networking group as we as we talked about. Push the stuff to their lab. And then we'll release it to the portal um, for whatever this approved build is or update, um, so the system engineers can pick it up. So I built this graphic so you can easily reference it um, when you're looking at him, so you can remember exactly what he does. Um, so on a typical day, he'll go through. I'm not going to go through every single detail. I hope that everybody read this before. Um, the link is available. It's available to the upstream. We should be using this um, when you're, you know, doing your work. So. Um, I'm not going to go through every detail because it is very detailed, um, and, and then we actually have more detail available if we need to enhance these more, but I think this is deep enough. Um, but on a typical day, um, from a high level, they're just going to go in and check whether they have errata available, any, any updates. They're going to go check on their host, make sure they're not, um, there's no crazy problems, nothing is down. Um, they're going to check sync statuses, if they've got a sync that's been running for a long time, they're going to check any tasks that are running, and if there's a problem, which there is generally, um, they're going to try to troubleshoot that, and that's going to take them quite a bit of time to try to figure out what's going on um, generally. So they spend a lot of time troubleshooting, um, and, and that goes for the host too. If there's a problem there, they're going to troubleshoot. Um, they're also going to create new builds um, that they're going to push to their labs. So they're going to continue making those builds that they're pushing out if they have new, new updates coming in, that kind of thing. Um, and then they're going to they're create those builds and they're going to push them out to the portal. And they're going to make sure that the administrators are us, utilizing them. That's what they're doing typically on, the, on their average day. As far as um, responsibilities on their team, um, as I said, there's multiple Linux specialists generally. And that's that's a well-funded infrastructure, but I think that's really who we're targeting. Because if we if we get it to work for them, we'll have a, it'll work for the smaller um, infrastructure. So um, generally two or two or three, maybe, and um, uh, Windows are going to have about the same. So they have a Linux person, Windows person, and then they have a networking security person on their team um, that interfaces with the network team and the security team, separate teams, but they have somebody that works with them um, to make sure that uh, the 
the networking security team are going to fulfill their tasks that they need them to do. Um, so all of those people on their team, which is six, maybe eight people, will work across the entire infrastructure. They're going to be working. They can see everything. Um, and they have control over everything. They're the super admins. Um, so they're going to see across. And then they'll also have like project managers to make sure. So if they have a big um, OS update coming up, they have to test it on all of their hardware in virtual, bare metal, or cloud. They have to test it on each one of them with each version, any update. So they'll make a specific project just for that. And it's going to take them months to push it out across the infrastructure, get it months to get the system administrators to adopt it. It's pretty slow moving because, you know, there's no, they'd rather have it get done six months slower than have their infrastructure break at any point. So time is on their side, you know, they want to use as much of it as possible, but if they if they break, it's a huge problem. Um, so they also have analysts, and it's really, this is, this is a critical role, and I think it's an opportunity for us to improve is, um, this, this is really a service for the company, so they, the, the tasks that they do, um, it's really important that we provide vision into the tasks that they do so we can see exactly how many errata have been applied, how many, how many updates, how many patches, whatever you want to call it, um, have been applied, how many operating systems they're managing, all of those things. They need a lot of reporting because they have to sell a lot of the things that they're doing to upper management. Um, so reporting is really important to them. They can't just do whatever they want. They have to make sure their time and you, the resources are accounted for. So they're the people responsible for that. So they have specific analysts on their team that try to They'll, they'll actually build a separate UI um, through, or I'm sorry, not a UI, but an API to um, aggregate this data so they can, and then this analyst job will be the, to like sell the um, management on the what they're actually doing. So uh, that's a really important aspect that I don't think we cover very well right now. Um, also, um, how, did, how do they use Catello Informant in, the, in their environment? Um, they're really going to use it to maintain their. They well, the first they'll maintain Catello and um, form and this, the servers and all of the all of the assets that come with that. Just just managing that is a job. Um, so they'll they'll do that and also the repositories that they're managing and the hosts that they're managing. They're, they're that's what they're really going to use Catello and Formant for. But there, a lot of work goes into managing Catello Formant itself. But their job is to map it to their infrastructure across their infrastructure. So they're going to build these. This Teleform, and they're going to build it. They're going to build it to mirror their infrastructure. They're also going to modify it as they grow. So if they they if they uh, acquire a new company, they have to modify their infrastructure to cover that new company. And so they're or if they get rid of a whole you know business unit, they got to um, scale it all back. So there's a lot of work there, and that takes a lot of time. Um, so they do that. They spend a lot of time doing those things, and also um, role-based access control. They're going to spend a lot of time doing that. Um, they do spend a lot of time doing that. Um, also, really, they're going to, as I said before, they're going to be creating those builds. Um, and they're going to be creating the requirements based on what's available in Catello Inform. And they're also going to get them approved. Then they're going to build that application, Catello Inform, and then they're going to push it out to those system administrators. So that's really what they're spending their time doing in the application. And then, of course, lifecycle management, which kind of covers what I just talked about. but. Um, checking new errata, making sure it's pushed out. That's that's their job. So updating their infrastructures. They're going to update their available hosts, and then those system administrators take those um, recipes and push it out, push the provision those new hosts based on the um, those recipes that they created. So then they're also we're going to talk about their challenges here, and it's important to keep these in mind. And these these can change as as the applications change. Um, but these are still problems, not even specific to Catello and Foreman, but specific to their their job. Um, one of the things that, I, they, that every one of them talked about is the workflow gap for the system administrators. As I said before, the system administrators, they don't know anything about configuration management. They don't know anything about, they're not going to have to, you know, manage role-based access control. They don't, they don't have to update the infrastructure. They don't have to do any of that. All they have to do is provision. That's it. Um, and also, there's a few other things they need to do, but really their job is to push those 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 recipes that the um, engineers built, and it's very difficult to them for them to do today. There's way too many options available, way too many sections of the UI that it, they've made accessible. Even if they lock it down, even if, if we made it not available to them to see, 
it's still the workflow is not optimized for them. So, um, so they have to build processes around the application to make up for um, gaps. So that's that's a huge thing for them. Um, so we should keep that in mind. Also, troubleshooting is very difficult when you have ten thousand systems that you're responsible for. Specific six in this case, six thousand um, Linux systems. It's very difficult to find a root cause with the hosts, or if there's an issue at all, it's it's not easy to find. So it's hard for them to troubleshoot, and it's also hard for them to find help. Um, they all have access to the portal. Um, if 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 they are you know Red Hat customers, they have access to customer portal. It's still difficult for them to find answers. So that's just one thing that um, we also need to keep in mind is that troubleshooting is difficult. Also, evangelization. So they have to sell um, what they're doing to the upper management. And also, they have to sell new technology. They have to sell everything they're doing to um, the other business units um, to get them to buy into it, to change their processes. So evangelization is a big part of their job, and I think a better reporting better reporting will be will be good there. And, I, and one of the customers, actually, one of the users, built a whole reporting application around this uh, this um, around Catel and Foreman because they had to have it. So they actually built the whole thing and spent time doing that. Um, but they said ideally it would be done in the application itself. So that's something we really need to focus on. But evangelization is going to be a problem for them even outside of the systems management. Um, another big thing is subscription management. Entitlement management is impossible for them um, based on our current the way we currently do things, and I think that's partially because, well, a big thing is because they have a procurement group, which is a separate se a separate person um, from their team, which the separate that separate procurement group person is does all the purchasing, so it's not really good reporting, so they don't know how many uh, entitlements they need, and the entitlements are becoming more and more complicated, so it's not just one to one, so they don't really know how many things they need, and especially when it's across a huge amount of uh, hard. It's across a huge amount of hosts, and those hosts are changing all the time. So there's, it's almost impossible for them to keep up with the entitlements. They they have extremely hard time, and that's if they don't have, and that's if they have automation, which a lot of them don't, and it's manual, and it takes them weeks, and sometimes they can't invest weeks. So it's very difficult for them to manage, um, and almost impossible. So that's the system engineer. This is the person responsible for all of that configuration. Now we're going to talk about so that system engineer over here. Then the system administrator uh, working in those business units is next, and that is Daniel. So, well, first I should ask: Are there any questions about that system engineer before I move on to Daniel? And we can act, we can talk after um, if we want. So the last thing I have right now is Daniel. So Daniel is a system administrator. Um, I actually tried to get Brian Kearney's picture in here, uh, but he wasn't going for it. Um, but anyway, we are, he says, this is another quote, he says, uh, we're hands-on, we're managing the infrastructure every day. So when the system engineer does builds, um, they're going to push them down, but they're only dealing with their, they're only dealing with their lab, um, their testing lab generally. They're not actually deploying out to their, into the wild, into their, into their infrastructure they have set up. So these administrators are the ones touching the infrastructure. They're the ones dealing with all of the old hardware, the new hardware, the cloud space, or whatever. So they need everything to be configured for them for that space. But they're the ones dealing with the problems. So they're the ones that are um, that are running the remote commands. They're scheduling updates. They're provisioning those new systems, and they're responsible for all the um, maintenance windows, things like that. They're responsible for making the updates. They're the ones that are awake at you know, 4 a.m. trying to run whatever update, not the system engineers. These are the guys in the trenches. So it's important to think about them when we're when we're creating these things. But as I said, and they're and they're they only care about their business unit. They don't care about the other business units. They get paid by their business unit, which for Daniel happens to be the web properties business unit. Um, and so we would treat in the current forming tell we would treat this as an organization. Um, he's only in Catello and Foreman specifically for two hours. He's in other tools, you know, the rest of the day, but he's only in specifically Catello and Foreman for two hours. It could be a lot less time to get the same amount of work done, um, is what I was told. Um, the years of experience for him is much is less. It's four years, 
Um, most likely it's even less um, because they really get their hands held a lot by the engineers. Um, uh, so they will request help from the engineers a lot because they don't know exactly how things need to be done. Um, a lot of times they'll make uh, cheat sheets and give them scripts, things like that. Um, the engineers will give the administrator scripts and cheat sheets um, because they don't have as much experience. And they have to, and the system administrators, as I said, have to be Windows experts as well. So that's really important to note that they need to be, they need to know about everything. So um, jack of all trades, but you know, one of the master of none, I guess. Um, so this small map, I, as I built for this engineer, I built here as well. But there's a release portal, as we talked about, with the available builds, and their job is to push it to the different labs. Now, there, I'm showing three labs here for the web properties. Um, most likely, there's a couple more um, that they have built, and one of them could, and and they're, here they're all virtual. One of them could be cloud. One of them could be virtual, but. Um, here we're showing all virtual, and there's different amount of hosts, and they're in different locations in different labs. Um, sometimes they're shared labs, sometimes they rent space, sometimes it, it just depends. It's different no matter what uh, across all the companies. But here we have three different labs, three different locations, all virtual. And we can update this more cloud eventually. So for Daniel, a uh, typical day of work involves either checking his mail or checking the portal. Um, and that release portal, as I'm pointing out here. So they'll even get a message that something is new, but either way, they're going to check it to make sure, to see if there's anything new available. And as I said before, the, these updates are generally very big, so they're going to know they're coming. So they need to know, they'll be, they'll be checking for them, whether they know they're coming or not. Um, and also, they're going to monitor their specific infrastructure. These three labs, they're going to monitor for problems. So they're going to check those hosts, to make sure they're still running, and they're going to... Um, they're also going to uh, fulfill their customer or their user um, requests. So if they have somebody new that's starting, um, or if they have a new web application they're going to be running that needs a bunch of new hosts with new software on it, they're going to they're going to build those um, based on what what they were given from the engineers. So um, or if they need to you know update credentials, they're going to be the ones doing that. So uh, they'll they'll respond to those requests, and usually they're tickets of some type. Um, but that's that's their job. Um, so that's what they're doing every day, and also you know, and that includes every night too, because they're the ones available or awake at nighttime. Um, so how are those responsibilities divided among their team? So they actually share responsibilities, as I said, with across Linux and Windows. So every system engineer that's on their team, which is usually five, six, seven, somewhere in there, between five and ten, um, depending on the size, probably for for four K. Um, for 4,000 hosts, we're talking maybe four, five um, on the lower side. So, but they're all responsible for everything. So um, they all do the same jobs. Um, sometimes they have a project manager type person, somebody to keep track of what's going on. But generally, and that, that's pretty rare, but generally they are responsible for everything. So all the provisioning, installation, configuration, operation, and maintenance of all their hosts, they're the ones responsible for it. And, and like I said, troubleshooting. They're going to be the ones troubleshooting on their specific hosts. Um, sometimes they'll have the engineers help them, and most likely it's them. Um, so that's that's what they're going to be. That's what they're all doing. Um, but they they, re they share responsibilities, and they'll maintain the infrastructure. Um, so they'll be the person. Re they'll all contact each one of them will contact um, networking if they have to, um, because networking services them as well as these system engineers. Um, so. How do they use Catello and Foreman? Um, you know, they're going to really optimize, use Catello and Foreman to optimize their infrastructure operations. So they're going to be deploying the new hosts, updating based on the system engineers' um, recipes, and making sure their hosts are updated and secure. They're they're going to be watching. They're going to be utilizing to to uh, the Catello and Foreman to. Um, they're going to be utilizing to keep their uh, infrastructure updated. So what are their biggest challenges? Uh, I mentioned it a little bit before, but um, the deployment process of new hosts is far too complex for them. Um, they don't know about that configuration management. They just need, they just need, they want to do a very simple task and it becomes very cumbersome um, in the current configuration of Talent Forum and it's very difficult for them to do. Um, and, and like I said, as well as the troubleshooting is very difficult for them to do. It's even harder because they don't have um, vision into what they don't have vision into uh, across what's going on, like the uh, 
across their infrastructure like the uh, system engineers do. So it's important for them to keep. It's important for them to watch, but also important for them to troubleshoot. And, and it's not something that's easy for them to do. Um, and it's very difficult for them to report back what's going on because there really is no reporting. Um, subscription management is also difficult. This there are three people removed from the procurement group. Um, so telling, figuring out exactly what they need is difficult for them, but it's also even more difficult to get what they need from the procurement group and communicate effectively what they need. Um, and, and again, because all the hosts are changing all the time, the, the, the status, it's hard for them to keep it updated and stay updated. That's a full-time job just doing that. Um, so that's Daniel. Um, so those are the, those are the, uh, um, personas that I have for now, uh, specific personas. So we have the company, Samuel and Daniel, and then again, and in the future we'll have developer operations. So I'm going to show you a little bit how they're going to be used, um, utilized, at least within our, our new features area. Um, this is something I'll be reviewing later, but um, I don't really have a good example of use cases for now, but I will just give an idea of how it's going to work. So here we're going to go, this is where we're going to go to see the new features. And this new feature section is going to have um, all the information about um, all of the features. So it's going to have the use cases, the requirements, the wireframes, and the development stories. This is where we're going to go to find everything. And this is available to everyone. Any, it's a wiki. Anybody can update it um, and, and push it back. So right now we're looking at disconnected server. We can see the targeted release, and we can see the targeted persona. So the disconnected server is some, somebody that's going to manage this disconnected server is really going to be the system engineer. So that's who we need to have in mind. Um, when we're talking about this this uh, use case. And then we have a link right directly to Samuel so we can see exactly who he is and what he does. Um, so here we're going to have the status of each one of these these sections of the application, or these sections of the, um, uh, the feature. Um, and we can't really move on until we have um, all these sections filled. So here we are waiting on the use cases, the requirements, the wireframes, because this is something that's brand new. And we don't even have the development stories assigned yet. But everybody knows that, and they can see that here. Um, and then so for use cases, we are going to have a, this is not a good example of a use case for this, but essentially in this section we'll have a whole story written up around Samuel and exactly what he needs to do in this disconnect, for this disconnected, um, this disconnected server. So he, we're going to go through his daily workflow and exactly how he's going to interact with it. And then we're going to take those individual sections and we're going to break them into requirements and put them here. Um, and then I will build wireframes around them or somebody will build wireframes around those requirements and then we'll turn them into development stories. So that's how I see them being used. And then anybody at any point, any developers, anybody working on this can go back and see exactly how it's going to be used and exactly who's going to be use it, um, use this feature and, and where they're going to use it. And it's going to help us avoid a lot of gaps. Um, and I think this would have been helpful in the past, but we have it now, and it's going to be helpful in the future as well. So um, this will help us avoid a lot of mistakes and, and changing things um, at a later date. So that's all I have for personas. Does anybody have any questions about this? No? Um, I know it's a lot of information. There's a lot of detail. I encourage you to go read through them. Um, ask any questions. Uh, that you like, or if you want to see more detail or more detail in any area, we can do that. I can't post the raw interviews, but what I can do is abstract some of that um, if we need it later. But I think this is definitely detailed enough. And I, and I encourage anybody who wants to learn more about personas, usability.gov is a great resource for that um, and how they're used. And we can, this is a new process, so we can modify it as we go. But it's really important that we are referencing these in the future. And, I, and it's going to be a little different, but I think it's going to be very helpful. Um, and that's it for me. All righty. Thanks so much, Kyle. Sure. Thanks, everybody else, for coming. Uh, enjoy the holidays. See ya. Thanks, Eric.